We're stepping into the Dungeoneers Lounge, the only D and D show on the internet. <laughs> that's so, actually true. It's the only that's, one. Yeah, it's the first one. All right. There's a lot of, hopefully, a lot of first-time DMs listening or people who have been playing for a long time and want to get into DMing, but they're a little bit intimidated. Uh, but what I want to know from you and what I think they want to know is how do you really get into it? What are the do's and don'ts that people don't really mm. tell you with DMing? I think the number one thing that people don't tell you is the hardest part of running the game is not actually running the game. Hardest part of running the game is running the personalities, is running the scheduling, running the food situation, running the conflict resolution, running the facilitation of a group event. The number one thing I wish somebody had told me when I was starting to run a game for my brother and my girlfriend was that eventually it would blossom into something that was, it required some management. It actually required effort to to keep putting together. It wasn't something that you could just hop in on a Friday night. Like you, somebody has to wrangle people. Somebody has to wrangle minis and there's things you have to buy and it's it's just not it's not as simple as i think people make it out to be but it's just because it's not simple doesn't mean that it's not easy it actually is pretty easy it's just not totally simple if that makes sense so i guess the first thing i would say is that really make sure that you only invite people to your game that you are comfortable if they fall in love with the game seeing every week and i know that sounds like a luxury problem because a lot of people are like well i don't have anyone to play with and that's a huge challenge for a lot of new DMs is actually finding a group. It's a huge challenge. But the truth is there are always more players than there are DMs. And there are always people who will want to, you to DM for them, especially with like the advent of video chatting, Discord, Reddit communities. These are places where people are looking for DMs actively and you will be loved there. Absolutely. And I think more on the player side of things, one of the big, big benefits with our current group is that some of the players we have now they weren't in our group from the start but we went we played a couple one shots with them and after the first one immediately we just knew we were like we have to play with these people every week it was fantastic yes. they jumped in feet first they'd never played before but honestly you couldn't tell enthusiastic players it was great but again you really do have to think who do you want to play with all the time? Because I can't imagine playing as much as we've played for as long as we've played without that level of enthusiasm. It adds so much to the game. It adds so much to the game as a player, but it adds so much as a DM. I can speak from this experience right now, which is that for me, I'm not looking for players that have the most technical skills. And as an early DM, it's very easy to go, I want the people who know more than me, or I want the people who I don't have to explain the rules to as much. No, no, no. Look for the people who have the good attitudes. Look for the people who have the collaborative mindset. You have a friend who some people might call them a pushover because they're so collaborative and they're so people pleasing. D&D is a perfect game for them. You have a creative artistic friend. They don't know the system at all. Invite them. You like Look for the character traits first when it comes to assembling a group. I think that's step one, especially if you're a lone DM. You have no one in your immediate circle who's interested in the game, and you're going to have to go find those people. Look for character first. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the challenges with getting new players as well. It's an impulse to want to get people who know the rules, know what they're doing. But if you can introduce someone to the hobby... Not only does that open up the pool of who you can bring into your table because they don't have to know it already, but you get to bring someone else into D&D, &D, and that on yes. its own is pretty cool. Well, it's cool, too. If you love something, you should want to share it, and I, I would never be intimidated by someone's lack of knowledge. Don't be turned off by that. Embrace that. Second mm -hmm. thing I would say is, is how many horror stories do we see on like Reddit and stuff about problem players this is something people it's a term people use a lot problem players oh so and so is a problem player problem players start because someone has not seen the early warning signs the early red flags of a problem player brewing i think your number one focus as a new dm is first just getting the game to function i mean you're in the process of building something building a set of skills and tools to be able to functionally run a game but second to that is know what traits you're looking for at the table that are going to foster good gameplay is someone on their phone constantly 
is someone fidgeting constantly and then you know whispering to another player is someone demeaning or um it being condescending to a player when you can see these things and catch those early as a new dm you're going to stop problem player players from developing or if they really are dead set in their ways they'll leave your table absolutely and that's one of the important morals here too is that you can teach someone over time the rules of the game you can't teach someone over time how to approach the game in a way that is respectful to the other people at the table and that helps everyone have a good just a good fun time because that's what you're really there to do maybe with enough time and effort you could but ultimately that's more of a personal issue that's not really what you're looking for that's something that needs to be fixed outside the table for the most part absolutely like that's you're not a therapist (laughs) you're here to run a game and have a good time as a new dm those are the things i wish people focused on more like you'll you'll get there are plenty of amazing videos on youtube about just um playing the game functionally one one quick second this right here dude i'll show the audience as well this is the starter set Everything you need to run a game of D&D is in this incredible box. So the Lost Minds of Fandelver is a great adventure. Like, it's one of those adventures that you look at and you're like, this is classic D&D. You're like going in a cave, you're killing a monster, you're saving a village. It's an amazingly cliched adventure. Like it's perfect for a new group. We started playing D&D with a version of that. I, I read as much as I could muster with my short attention span of Lost Minds of Fandelver, and I like uh, sort of cannibalized aspects of it to create our first adventure. If I didn't have that roadmap, we wouldn't have started playing. I would highly encourage you spend the 12 bucks on Amazon to pick up a starter set, and you're good, man. Just read the actual rules and watch good videos on YouTube. But outside of that, the thing that the book doesn't tell you, really, really start looking into leadership traits, like good leadership traits, how to command a room, um, I would practice your voices. I think that's always a fun thing. Like you guys at our table really enjoy the voices that I do. And I wouldn't be doing those voices if it wasn't something I practiced. Right. Um, So to add to that about the voices, I know that voices come more naturally to some people than others. One of the big, big things you want early on is when people do that, you kind of all acknowledge this is a little bit silly. It's a little bit ridiculous. That's part of the fun. One of the traits you want to look for in players is who makes everyone else comfortable doing that. Yes. If someone does a silly voice where they're like, I'm the ogre, and everyone hears that and they go, oh, haha, that's funny. And someone goes, wow, you sound ridiculous. Guess what? That person's never going to do a funny voice again. That's going to kill their fun. But if everyone's like, and the player that that said that should be put in their place. Absolutely. That's unacceptable behavior. It's that that's the kind of behavior you're trying to avoid, whether that's not playing with that person or just having a conversation and saying, Hey, I don't know if you know, you're doing this, but this is something we really aren't looking for. Um, But that's a huge element. Like that first thing you said about good looking for the right, kinds of behaviors in your table we were i was talking to a good friend one time and we were talking about taste and we had a a friend and they were saying oh i just don't get so-and-so's taste you know a mutual friend Mm -hmm. like oh you you tolerate listening to that or watching those movies i don't like those movies or music and I, i i told my friend i said hey the thing you're looking for in somebody to hang out with is not someone who has perfect taste again taste that aligns with your idea of what a good song is or what a good movie is you're looking for people who you can share things with each other people who their your tastes may not align but when you guys can meet in the middle and share things with each other you discover things that both of you hadn't discovered yet right and he was like oh that makes sense that's what i look for in friends it's also what i look for in players you want players who are willing to step out of their their mutual comfort zones and kind of meet in the middle without making anyone feel dumb that's my hard and fast rule at the table. If I if I see someone, nothing gets under my skin like a player making someone feel dumb. And at times, different people at the table have done that. And it's like, it's unacceptable. Yeah. It's unacceptable. And as a new DM, I, I thought that because we, because it was a group of people I knew very intimately and closely that these issues wouldn't arise. But D&D brings that out of people. Like the, the great things and some of the negative traits. I think the reason is, is because you're so immersed in a world. It's so immersive that you kind of forget some things. 
And I wish someone had told me like, hey, you're going to confront these issues at some point, the issues of a problem player, the issues of a um, lack of communication between players, the issues of people being bored by your game, people not focusing, people canceling last minute, like these things are going to come up. Those are the things I, I would prepare myself for more as a new DM. Absolutely. And I think from the player side as well, I know this section is more about new DMs, but this is helpful for everyone to know as a player, you also have to think, okay, am I doing these things? Cause I know myself personally, you know, this is a learning experience for everyone. There were certain, you know, problem player behaviors that even I had. Cause everyone does. Cause you don't yeah, know. Exactly. And that's why communication is so important. And that's why thinking about these things and talking about these things is so important. Cause a problem player isn't a person. The problem player thing is more about the kind of person who does these things. It's behavior. It's behavior. Uh, a good example is I, as we continue playing, I'm always learning to collaborate in a way where I'm not putting my idea forward and going, this is what we have to do. I'm going, this is what I think is the best course of action. What do you think? Mm -hmm. That's but hard. To bring us back on topic a little bit, because this was, this was a good tangent, but other things for new DMs really looking to get in, what are some other maybe challenges or even things that made it easier mm. starting out? I think, I think the biggest thing that made starting the game easier was just starting. It's like so many things in life. It's like you. It's like this podcast and YouTube show. Like we were sitting around talking about it, and I called you and was like, "Let's film it tonight. We're doing it. It might be shitty. People might not watch it, but we're doing it tonight." That's D and D. It's not plotting the perfect thing. It's we're doing it tonight. You call up your brother. You call up your sister. You call up your cousin. You call up your friend, and you say, "Hey, come to my house. We're grabbing some pizza rolls." playing tonight there's only going to be two or three of us like it may be a super small group we started with playing with three people myself you my girlfriend that was it and it was amazing we had a blast we introduced another player they sort of joined the party after that then we introduced two more players and we have a solid group but yeah just start is the first thing the other thing is understand how much improv you're in for and get comfortable with it as fast as you can you're going to be uncomfortable with it for a while but understand that like as a dm you think okay there's no way that the players don't do x y and z and they're going to do a b and c it's just going to happen repeatedly those would be my two biggest pieces of advice get comfortable with improv and just start period i can agree with those both wholeheartedly uh, to your first point about just getting started, the thing you have to remember is d and is a skill. Whether you're a player or a DM, and if you're waiting until you're good at it to start doing it, you're never going to start doing it because you can't get good at it on, before you're bad at it. You know. Yes. You have to go in. You have to play it wrong. You have to play like get five sessions in and go, oh, man. I didn't realize you couldn't concentrate on two spells at the same at the same time. Yeah. It's like I've been using all of these things that I can't use or little things like that or it's like, oh, opportunity attacks exist. Yeah. Things like that. It's, we didn't even start playing with opportunity attacks. There was a lot of stuff we didn't do. And it was great. The reason I think it was great for us to not do try to tackle all the rules at once. That's probably a good piece of advice too. Is we started playing with almost a version of D&D. &D. Because I read the rules and I consumed and comprehended as much as I could wrap my mind around in two or three nights of reading the starter starter set rule book, right? But even the starter set rule book, there's a lot there. And and if you've never contextualized D&D &D before, and really the game itself, you're looking at it and going, ah, how do I do this? How do I do that? And just starting and doing a version of the rules, like there were parts of the character sheet, I didn't even know what they meant. But we played anyways. I mean, we barely even use passive perception still and stuff like that. Yeah, but and honestly, like I use passive perception as a DM once in a blue moon, like during a wilderness encounter. Like players are moving through the wilderness, puts your passive perception. It's a plot device almost. It's yeah, I use it sometimes like as a plot device or or just to check and see if a roaming group of enemies would have seen them or if they would have seen a gro roaming group of enemies or something. But really, things like that don't even come to play a lot and. We're even sometimes a little 
I know this is sacrilege to like rules as written people, but we're sometimes a little loosey goosey on the, uh, um, on the spell rules too, like spell descriptions. Sometimes we're a little bit lenient with those and I'm let's, okay with that. Let's be honest. No one in the history of D and D has ever gone. You know what would make this more fun? Spell casting components. That's right. <laughs> Go find a little piece of linen and a slightly charred leaf. Let's do this. Well, and Never. this this will have to be another podcast topic because I think we're going to debate this a little bit. I think spell casting components definitely have their place. They don't. <laughs> they have no place in D and D. Such a player thing to say. No, I I, I would say this is this to, to bird's eye view. This I think prep for improv. Start just do it understand it's not going to go your way like i think the mindset is the most important part of it because like the actually playing the game it's a game at the end of the day it's a game here's another thing i want to say to to potentially new dms who are listening like if for some reason you've stumbled across this youtube video or this podcast in your journey to find out more about D, one i'd be shocked because we don't have nearly as many views as like the legends of matt colville and not yet not yet but it'll get there but if you happen to stumble across this as a new dm I want you to understand that there's, there's the culture itself is awesome. The culture of D and D is awesome. That doesn't even extend to all tabletop RPGs, but usually that's the case. Like there are other gaming hobbies that the communities, you know, as a video gamer, like the communities suck. That's not the case with D and D for the most part, people will be really apt to help you on spaces like Reddit and discord. Um, there's a, an official, D D beyond discord that i'm a part of that's a great resource for new dms there are a lot of discord channels that you can discord servers you can join that will just be happy to help you if you're a redditor um, reddit uh, spaces like dm academy and D D behind the screen are great communities i i personally have found a ton a ton of luck in places like dm academy that's been a subreddit that has helped me out immensely and the people there have been nothing but kind um i've been called out a few times for maybe opinions that were a little bit contradictory to my goals, but that's great. Like constructive feedback is great. It's all part of the learning process. Yes. It's what we're here to do. Exactly. You, you never stop learning, which is kind of the beauty of it because you've never finished learning D and D. No. Whether even if you know every single word of the player's handbook, the dungeon master's guide, all of the source books, you still never finished because what are new ways you could take the story? What are new things you could do? That's kind of the beauty of it. It is. And it, it's easy to feel as a DM. I know this isn't on the subject of new DMs, but as a DM, it's, it's just easy to feel like you're played out, like you've done everything. And it's so stupid to think about. <laughs> like you have the entire immensity of your imagination and existing fiction that you can rip off. And you're like, I think I've done it all. And it's like, no, that's that's not the case at all. It's it's ever it's never ending. I think it's another thing too, is don't rush yourself with TNT. Like start with a dumb quest. There's rats in the basement. Do a fetch quest. What's a fetch quest? Oh, that's a that's a term usually within the video game community okay. where uh, it's kind of like if you go into a town and you get a quest, you're like, all right, I'm going to go do something awesome. And the NPC's like, go get me this thing and bring it back. Ah, uh, yeah. Basically, go fetch. You can make fetch quests fun and interesting, in especially in something like D&D, where the limits are so broad, you can say, and I think this is really great for new DMs to know, obviously you want variety, but you can say, oh, go fetch me this item. And then the players go, oh, I know how this works. I go, I get it. Maybe there's some mm -hmm. traps. Maybe there's a monster. And then you get there and it's something totally different from what they expected. Or maybe it all goes as planned but it goes a little too well yep they bring it back and the npc goes ah now i can finally use it for this and you realize it's not what you thought they were going to use it yep. for even in what feel like played out tropes and things like oh a fetch quest or this that and the other you can still innovate and make those interesting absolutely i i was aided very much by my my background as a filmmaker when i started dming um as you know i've been a filmmaker for seven years I've written countless screenplays. I write a lot. I write a lot of stories I write, and I write a lot of condensed stories. I've never written like a novel or anything, but I've written plenty of screenplays and I've written plenty of commercials and music videos, et cetera, et cetera, right? For anyone who has no story experience, oh, I cannot recommend um, 
books like Story by Robert McKee. Like, there are tons of resources about screenwriting. Uh, the heroes, uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell. Um, Dan Harmon has a great resource called The Story Clock, which is a way of mapping out a screenplay that I find very helpful for D&D. Like getting into just storytelling period will improve your skills as a DM, especially as a new DM, understanding the basics, the basics of story. But here's, here's what I want to say. Matt Colville has a great term for this. He says tension and release. I have a different way of verbalizing that. Like he says that's the essence of drama. I agree with him to an extent. In my realm of screenwriting, the the way we frame it is goal and obstacle, right? I think oftentimes when you're running a dry D&D session, there aren't enough obstacles or the goal isn't tantalizing enough, right? Think about how many sessions even we've had where I'm not running it well. <laughs> and a lot of the reason you guys aren't having fun is because the goal, the quest is like, eh. It's like, I, I don't want that thing or I don't want that award or whatever the, the reward on the, whatever the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is, is not that tantalizing. Or it's a piece of cake and the obstacles aren't there. If you can come up with an interesting goal and then an interesting obstacles, you can build a D&D session. That's really just the essence of what the game is. You just say, yes. this is what you're going for. This, These are the tools at your disposal. This is what's in your way. Just make it from point A to point B. And you might end up with point B ending up at point C you might have to go to point A to point D to point F to point B, but <laughs> that happens more often than not. Absolutely. But that's the beauty of it. It's very free form. It's very different. But again, if you're a new DM and you're saying, all right, I want to put players down in, or I want to sit the players down in front of me. I want to open up with this adventure. I want to go just don't pressure yourself to make it some sort of innovative subversive story because run a harry potter one level quest like if you think about the ending of harry potter and the sorcerer's stone at the end of that movie spoiler alert <laughs> they're literally going down into a basement and have like three challenges to get through to get the sorcerer's stone the sorcerer's stone is a macguffin if you're not familiar with a macguffin it's a filmmaking term for a it's the thing you want the thing you want the object of of desire and it could be anything in this case it's the sorcerer's stone <laughs> Harry, Ron, and Hermione go down in the basement. They have to fight Fluffy the dog. They have to get past the uh, the poison ivy sort of uh, vines that are wrapping around them. Devil snare. Devil snare. Yeah, they have to do the chess game. And that movie completes with them getting to the Sorcerer's Stone and facing the bad guy. Hey, that's a quest right there. Three challenges. Oh, there's moving vines. There's a chess game you have to play. And there's, a, a, in the book, there was like, well, there was a room of flying keys. Mm -hmm. There was like... Um, in the book, there was uh, poisons to choose from. Some of them were fake. Some of them weren't, if I remember correctly. Like that's the essence of a good D and D session. That's a whole session right there. Well, that really it's, if you think about the climax of that movie, it's just a dungeon with puzzle rooms Yes, and it's linear, it's simple, but it's compelling. And I'm going to quote Matt Colville here again, daddy, he, Matt, we love him. His name is never going to stop coming up in this show. We love him. But Matt Colville, if you're watching this by any miracle of God, we're going to keep shouting you out. Please, please let us do something with you, whether that be lick your shoes or just look in your eyes. Or like an interview. Um, caress your hair. Or like a chat. Uh, <laughs> there's options. There's options. But We love you, Daddy Matt. The, the king himself, Matt Colville, once said something I love because I've been watching his Running the Game series, which... Not to I've divert, watched it like three or four times. Not to divert people away from us, but watch it. Watch running the game. Well, after you finish this, yes. go watch that. But he said that you're only as good a writer as your sources are obscure. That's not an exact quote. But the point he was making is that you can just pretty much steal from things. And as long as your players can't tell what you're stealing from, it's new to them. Yes. So why reinvent the wheel? Yes. Like, if you take straight from Harry Potter, your players might go, wait a minute. There was Devil's Snare. Then there was this chess puzzle. Now we're within Satan's vines? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is oddly similar. Like, they're going to see through it at that point, but maybe go with something a little bit more obscure. Like, if you get cool ideas from something like Dune, and your players have never read Dune. Dude, I, we've talked about this before. I'm going to admit something on this podcast, this vodcast, if you will, that... <laughs> I think 
I think I've told you this before. The amount of content I have ripped off from Dune for our current campaign is absurd. Literally, there's a town in our world with a duke who runs the town. And I was reading through Dune. There's Duke Leto. And I read that and I was like, I'm going to name my duke Duke Lakota. I just added another syllable. It was like the same thing. I literally rip off Dune all the time and no one cares. Like you guys love it. It's because none of us have read Dune. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's a perfect illustration of the point. I didn't know that guy was in the book. Yes. Until just now. I mean, it's it's absurd how much I rip off from Dune, but that's because it's an amazing piece of source material and I always have my own spin. I mean, it's not copy and paste. Yoji Yamamoto is a fashion designer. He designed Y3, if you guys know Y3, the fashion brand. I don't. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm but wearing Crocs right you, now. I will frame it this way. Yoji Yamamoto is considered a very edgy, forward-thinking, innovative fashion designer. He, he really brought Japanese fashion to the American scene in a big way, especially in the early 2000s, right? He has a great quote that I love that says, copy, copy, copy. At the end of the copy, you will find yourself. The idea being that when you're used to copying things time and time and time again, there will come a point when you know what you like and what you don't like. And if you're worried about developing taste, the intimidating factor of developing taste, whether that be as a writer, as a DM, as a YouTube creator, (laughs) like a lot of what we're doing right here is a mashup of Matt Colville and Dimension 20's Adventuring Academy. And I think I'm okay to admit that. A little bit of Dungeon Dudes. A little bit of Dungeon Dudes. We love all of these. Shout out Double D. Shout out Double D. We <laughs> so weird. It's poorly phrased. Poorly phrased. We love the dungeon dudes. We That's l- the message. But dude, I can I can speak for both of us when I say we love these guys. We love Matt Colville. We love Brendan Lee Mulligan. We love the dungeon dudes. So when we watch those channels, we're like, we're gonna emulate that, put our little bit of our own spin on it until we reach the point where we know this is what we love and this is what we don't love. Copy, copy, copy. At the end of the copy, you'll find yourself. That's all I have to say about being a new DM. I think that's perfect.